Hello, my name is Ashley and I'm the Field Application Specialist for Empire Genomics. I've put together this webinar to review protocol optimization and to help you understand the important considerations of each part of different FISH protocols as you work on optimizing your own lab's protocols. So let's go ahead and get started. The first slide concentrates on FFPE slide processing. And you'll notice on each of these slides in the upper left-hand corner, there's kind of a breakdown of the major steps of these protocols and what is involved. So you'll see for FFPE slide processing, you have step one, which is deparaffinization. Step two is your pretreatment. Step three is gonna be your digestion. And step four is your hybridization. So over to the right here, you'll kind of see a little bit more of an in-depth breakdown of important considerations for each of those steps, starting with deparaffinization. So with deparaffinization, warming your slides in the oven is key. This is really gonna ensure that the wax melts and washes away in xylene. I have seen labs that don't warm their slides and they don't have an adequate deparaffinization of the slide and that's just gonna cause issues with signal and digesting your tissue and just it's a bad way to start out this whole process so you want to be sure to warm your slides um, at a, just an adequate enough temperature you can usually see when the wax begins to melt and uh, figure out a proper time for your oven and your lab uh, that that's good enough to see the melted wax and know that it's good to go into xylene um, another thing is that the amount of xylene and the time in xylene varies from lab to lab uh, it's just really recommended that you do more than one wash, so two or more typically, and that each wash you use fresh xylene. That's really important because the wax is washing off into that xylene and, and you want to move that slide over to someplace with fresh xylene each time. So two to three washes is pretty typical and what I see anywhere from five to 15 minutes is, is another uh, the time range that I see. So that's something that you want to test and, and figure out what works best for you and what's most efficient for your lab. Um, moving on to pretreatment. For pretreatment, pH is very critical when looking at this step. You want to make sure that your pH is right around 6.8 to make sure that the cells don't degrade because of a too high, a too basic, or a too acidic pH. Pretreatment is really required to break crosslink proteins and allow the probe to penetrate the cell. So it's really important that you get it to a high enough temperature to break those bonds and that you try to keep that temperature as uniform as possible for the duration of the pretreatment process. So typically in, in our protocol, we like to see 90 to 95 degrees and for about 30 minutes that that slide sits in that to break all of those bonds and allow that probe to get into the cell. Uh, moving on, we have digestion. This is by far the most important step of FFPE slide processing. And it's the step that I see so many problems with because each tissue in and of its own is unique. And different tissues can require different amounts of digestion time. So it's really important to, to look at that and know that if you're having tissue issues per se, you wanna look at digestion first because that's typically where the issue lies. Under digestion and over digestion often results in weak or no signal. So it, you should really, you and your techs and your lab should become comfortable being able to distinguish the morphology of the tissue and what looks proper digestion wise because that's going to yield the best result so you know consider the tissue you're using there's going to be a trial and error process here to find the best time for your lab and i understand it's really difficult when you're a larger lab and you're running multiple tissue specimens to do a different time for each one but if you can, that's definitely going to yield the best result from the probe and you're gonna see accurate results from doing that. So our last step is hybridization. So with FFP slide processing, you definitely wanna make sure you're utilizing the proper ratio of probe to buffer. I've seen a lot of different things for your labs. People seem to think that because it's tissue, you need to use more probe and less buffer because more probe is gonna give stronger signals. 
when really they tend to have a digestion problem again and have weak signals because they might not be digesting the tissue long enough or maybe they're over digesting it and they're not seeing any signals because you've now degraded that DNA. So you really only need two microliters of probe, eight microliters of buffer for a total of 10 microliters per cellular area. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. Don't overthink it. If you're using the right protocol for that probe, you shouldn't have to use more probe. Um, next, you definitely wanna make sure that you're denaturing at the appropriate temperature. Uh, some labs denature at the temperature that they denature blood, which is 72, 73, 74, depending on the lab and their protocol. But you want to up it for tissue. You want to do around 83 degrees Celsius for three minutes. And that's important. And I often see a lack of signal because labs are not denaturing at a high enough temperature. Uh, finally, you want to fully seal the cover slip with rubber cement. This is crucial. It's gonna make sure that the probe does not dry out. It's gonna you know, keep, keep it moist and allow for proper denaturation and hybridization. And again, you wanna be sure that that stays in a dark, humid environment during hybridization. And um, look at the stringency of your wash. If your stringency is too high, you can wash away signals. And if your stringency is too low, you can just have a lot of background. So that's another important thing to look at. Uh, if you notice in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, I wrote that between every step, you need to wash. Um, I've seen a lot of protocols where people don't wash after deparaffinization or after pretreatment or after digestion. And it's really important to make sure that you wash in between those things because you need to terminate that chemical reaction of the previous step. If you just remove something from digestion and you don't wash that slide, that slide's gonna continue to digest and that pepsin is gonna continue to eat away at your cell and you're gonna yield bad results. So between all of these steps, always make sure that you're washing. So moving on to blood and bone marrow protocols. Uh, again, up in the left-hand corner there, I've outlined just the major steps. So you have step one is halting cell division in metaphase using colsimid. So this is an optional step dependent on whether your lab requires metaphase fish or not, but I threw that in there just in case. Step two is swelling the cells with hypotonic. Step three is fixing your cells. And step four is dropping your cells. So again, important considerations for each step. Um, let's talk about acquiring metaphases. You want to ensure you're using the proper amount of colsimid and for the proper amount of time. Uh, our protocol and most normal protocols recommend 50 microliters that you use and for 30 minutes. So moving on to swelling cells, getting the right timing with hypotonic is important. If you leave a cell in hypotonic too long, that cell can burst and you don't want that. So approximately 25 minutes in hypotonic is plenty of time to get that cell to the proper size for interface fish. Uh, fixing cells. So use coronary's fixative. I've seen labs use different fixatives that can be too harsh or not harsh enough. When it comes to blood and bone marrow, always use coronary's fixative, the three to one methanol to glacial acetic acid this is very important. And prefixing is very important. Prefixing with the coronized fixative is going to yield a crisp, clean cell and crisp, clean, bright signals. For some reason, it seems like a lot of labs skip the prefix step, and that's one of my favorite steps because it really makes a big difference in the results that you see. It's also important because without prefixation, you could shock your cells. So you don't wanna just go ahead and throw 10 mils of very harsh fixative on top of cells. Um, adding one to two mils of fixative in hypo for that prefix step, it kind of eases those cells into the fixation process. You also wanna be sure that you're placing the cells through at least three rounds of coronized fixative uh, to effectively remove all the de debris and obtain clean cell pellets. Finally, dropping slides. So if you are not performing metaphase fish, it is acceptable to drop at the bench with no specific environmental conditions. Interphase cells don't need anything special. 
uh, you mostly just want to pay attention to your concentration and ensure that you're not dropping too heavy because that can cause some issues with signal. So find a good concentration, drop at the bench level. It's quick, it's easy. You don't have to worry about temperature or humidity. However, if your lab is looking for metaphase fish and metaphase spreads, you're going to want to do that in a controlled environment such as a thermotron. And that's going to control that temperature and humidity to allow a proper drying time to give you very beautiful metaphase spreads. So typically, temperature-wise, you want to go somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius. This seems to be good for that proper metaphase spreading. And then you typically see 50 to 60% humidity yields a good drying time. So this is something that you have to test in your lab, in your specific environment, and see what yields the best metaphases for you. And oftentimes you'll have to drop some test slides to make sure that those settings are proper. It will make sure in the end you have beautiful, well-spread metaphases that are easy to see signal on. Uh, another thing that's pretty important when it comes to dropping slides is using fresh corn ice fixative. And oftentimes labs even use cold corn ice fixative. Um, that's dependent on the lab. I tend to like to use cold corn ice fixative um, if you don't use fresh fix, corn oils can absorb water and alter the pH over time. So the fixing properties of it could change and it could cause debris on the slide and poorly spread metaphases. So just mix a fresh batch of the corn ice fixative and use that when you're dropping for metaphase spreads especially that's that's more important. And if you see a lot of debris on your interphase drops, then it could be just, the need to spin down that pellet and resuspend with fresh corners fixative. So we're moving on to blood and bone marrow hybridization protocol. And this is just going to provide some, some quick tips and considerations when you're looking at hybridizing blood and bone marrow. First, you want to be sure you're using the proper amount of probe again. So again, uh, labs think more probe is going to yield a better signal or some labs use 12 for tissue, 11 for some bone marrow tests, and 10 for some other ones, and it's just too complicated. Just use the recommended amount, 2 microliters of probe, 8 microliters of buffer, 10 microliters per cellular area. Again, be sure to cover slip the probe in the cellular area fully and seal it with rubber cement. That's really important. We don't want the probe to dry out overnight. Uh, denaturation for blood and bone marrow is lower than that of FFP tissue cells. We recommend 72 to 73 degrees for two minutes. So make sure you pay attention to your settings on your hybrite or if you're doing manual um, hybridization and denaturation, then make sure you pay attention to that temperature. You again want to ensure that you're hybridizing in a dark and humid environment. So hybrides and thermobrites, those are really ideal and easiest to use, but if you are hybridizing manually and denaturing manually, just be sure to use a humidity chamber to keep those slides in so that it's dark and humid. And again, I want to touch base on wash conditions. Uh, wash conditions are really crucial, and I see a lot of labs who feel they have a lot of background or uh, their signals are weak with blood and bone marrow, and that's because of a wash that's far too stringent or one that's far too weak. Um, so really pay attention to the stringency of your wash and take that into consideration if you're having issues. Maybe alter the stringency. If you're having background, maybe try to agitate the slides a little bit more to really get a good wash and to really get that liquid against the slides and getting away that excess probe. It's so important to, to pay attention to the stringency and making sure that it's proper can leave you with no background and just make sure your signals are as bright and crisp and clean as they should be. So our last slide, we're going to just touch on some adherent cell tips. I get a lot of questions about adherent cells, so I figured adding a few tips in might be helpful for some of the labs out there. So first of all, uh, what I see a lot with adherent cell fish is people using coronized fixative because it is recommended for blood and bone marrow. However, with adherent cells, coronized tends to be too harsh. So you want to use a formaldehyde in 1x PBS. This is a little bit less harsh. 
It's going to help with the morphology of your cells. It's going to be much better looking in the end. So I've put a little recipe there of a fix that you can use for adherent cell. It tends to work well with almost every protocol I've worked with. That's a great mixture for fixative. Um, another thing that makes working with adherent cells a lot easier is growing those cells on chamber slides. So this is a convenient way to fix the cells onto a slide and takes out that middleman of having to transfer cells onto the slide. You can grow them, fix them, and remove that chamber and just go straight into probing and hybridizing. So I do recommend using those. And then finally, with hybridization of adherent cells, it's just similar to blood and bone marrow. You want your temperature again to be between 72 and 70 degrees Celsius for about two minutes. I've seen people do way below that and way above that. So just stick with the same kind of protocol you use for blood or bone marrow with that. And again, keep it in a dark, humid environment as you would for all fish testing.